I want to turn our attention immediately this afternoon to the word of the Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse number 1, reading through verse number 10. I want to talk to us today on the topic, this is our message. Amen. This is our message. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 10. I'll put it up on the screen for those in the house of the Lord. The word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, meaning Peter, and then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, meaning the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Again, I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic. This is our message. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time. Master, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to delve into the Word of God. This is the source of our nourishment. This is the source of our strength. This is indeed the source of our hope and the source of our joy. Master, we believe, as a spirit-filled church, we believe that the preacher of the gospel has been called to a mighty, powerful, wonderful task to represent the perfection, the holiness, the righteousness of an eternal God who went to lengths unimaginable to the human mind in an effort to bring salvation and restoration to those that he might call his people, that he might one day take unto himself as his bride. Master, we believe that with this calling comes anointing. We believe, God, that you anoint your messenger that the Spirit of God rests upon its words, that you help us to deliver your message to your people in such a manner that, Lord, they're able to hear it and know as they hear it that it is from God. It is not the mandate of man. It is not doctrine that is concocted out of the imagination of human thinking. But Master, today we need the anointing. We need the Holy Ghost. 
to rest upon me. I'm weak, I'm feeble, I'm frail, I'm human, I'm sinful. Oh God, how we need the anointing if the word of the Lord is to accomplish what it is set forth to accomplish. Master, today in the name of Jesus, touch every ear as they hear. Let them receive with gladness the word of God, which is able to bring salvation, healing, deliverance. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Praise the name of the Lord. Our work here in Alabama is new. We're not well known in this area. People don't know us. They don't know what we preach. They're not certain of our message. I've preached seven messages so far here in the Huntsville, Decatur area. And today I felt led of the Holy Ghost to deliver a word that clearly articulates the message that we preach so that those in this community and in this area can know right up front we have a message. Hallelujah. There are a lot of affirming churches today which in all truthfulness have no message. I know of one church that years ago, I've told you the story before, I called the pastor when I first came back to the Lord in 93, I called the pastor of uh, the only affirming work that I was at all familiar with or that I heard anything about, and I asked her a couple of theological questions, and she literally sat there and, and said to me over the phone, well, I, I don't understand what you're asking. I, I don't understand what you mean. I'm not sure I understand. What, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And then finally I said to her, I said, well, ma'am, let me ask you this. What do you preach? What is your message concerning salvation? What does one have to do to secure eternal salvation? And she said, um, I, I'm not sure I, I quite get what you mean. And I don't quite, I'm not sure I get, I couldn't believe this woman's answer. I knew right then and there there wasn't no way on earth I was going to that church. Honey, people go to the house of God to find answers. Mm -hmm. They don't go there so you can stumble and stutter over yourself and not have a clue what you preach. And then after we started our work in New York City, I actually went to this church one Sunday to visit. I thought, well, I'll just show myself friendly. I'll just try to show myself, you know, being friendly and what have you. And I went, and they had a good group of people in that church, I'll tell you what. They must have had 60 people or so or better. Had a little choir. Oh, they had it all hooked up. She got up to preach, and she said, tonight I want to talk to you, she said, uh, from a passage in a book that I've been reading, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. She literally read a passage out of a book, and honey, this wasn't even a spiritual book, this wasn't even a, you know, any kind of a spiritual book. This was kind of like one of those self-help books, you know. And she read a passage out of this self-help book. And then she proceeded to stand up there and talk about it for 30 or 40 minutes. I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. There are a lot of people in the church, there are a lot of people in the world today who think that LGBT people and those of you who love us and support us and are willing to worship and stand beside us. There are a lot of people out there who want to believe that people like us, you know, we don't take Christianity seriously. We don't take the Word of God seriously. It's all just a big game. Oh, these people are just playing church. These people are just playing games. 
with God. They're not being the least bit authentic. They're not being the least bit genuine. Well, I've got news for you, honey. Um, I am. I don't know about the church down the road. I don't know about a church in Dallas or about a church in New York, but I know about one here in Decatur, Alabama. And I'm here to tell you, we take Christianity seriously. We take our message seriously. We know what we preach, and we preach what we know. Hallelujah. We're not playing games. We're trying to help people straight, gay, cross-eyed, and blind make heaven their home and see Jesus one day. We're trying to help people establish a walk with God that will sustain them all the days of their life. And if I may say so myself, and obviously considering the enormous crowd we have here this morning, this afternoon, if you know I'm, I'm going to have to say it myself. I think the teaching and the preaching that comes from this church is superb. Say, well, Pastor, you're just patting yourself on the back. Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Let me tell you something. Honey, I preach what I preach today by the grace of God, just like Paul said. <laughs> he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I got news for you, sweetie. Uh, who I am today, what I preach today, how I live today is not what I believed and what I lived and what I preached 40 years ago, nor is it what I lived and taught and believed 30 years ago. I'm here to tell you, I believe based on the messages and the teaching that God has given me that I have shared with the church over the last 30 years that I've been in affirming ministry, I I believe this church outshines uh, some of the greatest mega churches in America. I'll be honest with you. I really do. One of the things that makes me just about want to vomit say, boy, Pastor, you sure do use colorful language. Yeah. Oh, I hate to tell you, but I feel colorful. One of the things that makes me sick to my stomach is the fact that I know that the quality of the message, the quality of the preaching, the quality of the teaching, the quality of the anointing, the quality of the move of God, the quality of the vision that this ministry has is so much greater and better in quality than what I see when I look out on the internet, what I see when I watch preachers on TV. And it just makes me nuts that people aren't running. They shouldn't, Tommy, they shouldn't be crawling to be in this place. They should be running to be in this place. I've preached messages that I've gone away in. Tommy will tell you, every single Sunday I do this. Every single Sunday. <laughs> He'll ask me sometimes, so how did you feel your message went over? How do you feel you did with your message? And honestly, I kid you not, 99.9% .9 of the time, I, I am very uncertain. I'm very unsure. I, I'm not, oh, you know, just brimming over with confidence. I'm not one of these who thinks I'm some great preacher, some great orator. I don't look at him and say, oh, I think it was wonderful. I think it did beautiful. Blah, blah, blah. No, most of the time I look at him and say, well, gee, I don't know. I'm going to have to listen to it and, and see how it hits me. I'm going to have to listen. Because there's something about the anointing. There's something about the way the Holy Ghost moves in me and through me when, when I preach. While I'm up here preaching, I just don't see what you see. I don't feel what you feel. I don't sense what you sense. But when I leave the pulpit and I go home and I edit the video and I get it published to YouTube and all that, you know, then I will watch the message. And when I, when I watch myself preach or when I listen to myself preach, I literally, literally try 
to put myself in a mindset like, what if I were just somebody that walked into this church and wasn't familiar with it and, you know, and I literally tried real hard to put myself in kind of that place so that I could listen to the preacher as though it's not me. I'm not listening to me. I'm not, I don't care about me. I, I don't care about, I'm not listening to see how wonderful I am. I'm listening to the content of the message. That's all I care about is the quality and the content of of the message and was it delivered with anointing was it delivered with love was it delivered with divine authority that's all i care about so i listen to it like that and i'm going to tell you something i don't know how many times i've watched one of our services and my god have mercy that message has bowled me over. It has knocked me right out of my socks. It has just blown my mind. The anointing and the power of God are present. The quality of the message is superb. And I, I've told Tommy, I said, dear Jesus, if I walked into a church and the preacher got up and preached that message like that to me, honey, you would. it would take a a shotgun and a crowbar to get me off of that pew. I'd want to be part of that church. That's why I don't understand how it is that this wonderful ministry, this wonderful anointing that God has placed in the midst of the LGBT community can just be ignored and passed over and walked by by thousands upon thousands of people. I'm going to tell you something. I believe with all my heart that somewhere, somehow, some way, there are people, straight, gay, and otherwise, who value the quality of the message, who value the anointing, who value the presence of God, who value the power of God. I believe with all my heart that somewhere there have to be people who feel like I do about these things. They may not be enough to fill a mega church, but honey, they should be enough to fill this church. I want to tell you today, this church has a message. The problem is this. A lot of people don't understand that the gospel, listen carefully to what the preacher is about to say, the gospel is not the entirety of our message. What? <laughs> What, what did the preacher just say? The gospel is not the entirety of our message. No, it is not. The gospel is our message. It is the story of the effort that God went to to provide salvation for lost humanity. It's that story which is the gospel. It is that story which is the good news of Jesus Christ, okay? That is the gospel. The problem is there are thousands of churches and many denominations and many different organizations in our world today, listen carefully, that all preach the gospel. They all tell the same story. Jesus, like Paul said in our primary text, Jesus lived. He died according to the scriptures, and I tell the truth. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. They all tell the story of Jesus Christ who came and lived and died and rose again for the salvation of humanity. But that is where the similarity ends. 
all of a sudden now, from that point of beginning, the message begins to veer off in hundreds of different directions. Let me read for you today from Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 42. On the day of Pentecost, the birthday of God's church, any theologian, I don't care if they're Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Episcopalian, Baptist, any theologian, even Roman Catholic will tell you that Pentecost was in effect the birthday of the church. The Lord told his people, carry ye in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come upon you. He said, don't you go anywhere until you receive the Holy Ghost, right? So the church was in essence put on ice until the Holy Ghost came. Once the Holy Ghost came, then the church was unleashed. And it was allowed at that point to go out and preach a message. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost a lengthy message. He preached the gospel. He preached what Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if only churches today would stick to preaching the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ lived. Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ rose again. Hallelujah to God. But oh no, we've got churches today that have traded the good news of the gospel for a message that is not the gospel. They're anti this, they're anti that, they're against this one, they're against that one. Their entire message is a message of vitriol and malice and anger and angst. Honey, you're not preaching the Thank God that isn't our message. Listen to what Peter said at the end of his message, preaching the good news of the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to how he ended his message on the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church. He said, verse 36, Acts 2, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. These are two different titles, Lord and Christ. They're not one and the same. He said, but God's made this man Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now listen. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Honey, you can preach the gospel till the cows come home. All the gospel will do, all the gospel is meant to do, is cause men and women, boys and girls, to look and ask the question, what must we now do? That's what the gospel is designed to do, folks. That's what the okay. So Jesus came. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose again from the grave. Okay, great. So what? What do we do with that? Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, the message is more than simply the gospel. No, after the message, you've got to be able to provide an answer to the question: What must we do? I asked that preacher lady in New York, what must one do to secure salvation? I literally was asking her the exact question that was asked of Peter and the other apostles on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. 
and in verse 37, I literally was asking her the same identical question. What shall we do? And all she could say was, well, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. I'm not sure I get your question. I'm not sure. Oh no, we have a message. And this is our message. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of, of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children. And to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now listen to verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Okay, we've got all kinds of churches, all kinds of denominations, all kinds of groups that preach the gospel. The good news of Christ did crucified, buried, risen again. They all agree on the basics. But then the message begins to go in all kinds of different directions. But wait a minute. On the day of Pentecost, on the birthday of the church, Peter provided in the most poignant and concise fashion possible the answer to the question, what must we do? You ask Baptist folk, what must we do to be saved? Well, now, let me take you to the book of Romans, hallelujah. We'll walk down the Roman road. Baloney, that is a lie from the pit of hell. The Roman road leads to Rome, honey. It doesn't lead to heaven. The road that leads to heaven is the message preached by the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. He made it clear. He made it plain. He expounded. He broke it down. He said, repent, meaning turn from unbelief to faith. Turn from sin to God. Turn around. That's what repent means. He said, repent and be baptized. Who? Every one of you. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. My God, he made it so clear. He didn't leave one T uncrossed or one I without being dotted. Peter made his answer abundantly clear. Repent and what does that mean? In other words, you ain't going to be saved simply by repenting. No. He said repent and. Repent and be baptized. Again, how? In the name of Jesus Christ. Not in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. No, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Who is to be baptized in this fashion? Every one of you. There were people at on the day of Pentecost, there were people at Jerusalem from all over the world who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, which was a Hebrew holiday and a Hebrew festival. There were Jews from around the world who had come to uh, the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And Peter said, repent 
and be baptized. Every one of you. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter your nationality or your background. I got news for you, honey. There were Romans living in Jerusalem. They were occupying the land of Israel at that time. Surely in the audience that day, there were any number of Romans who were part of the Roman occupation who heard Peter preach and when the question was asked what shall we do they heard the same answer repent and be baptized to every one of you how in the name of Jesus Christ why for the remission of sins and oh what it wasn't just repent and be baptized. No, 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 no. It continues. Then Peter said, and ye shall receive. He didn't say you might. He didn't say you may. He didn't say you could. He didn't say you should. He said, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children. So he's saying it goes beyond you. It goes to the next generation. He said to all that are afar off, it goes beyond the boundaries of Jerusalem. It goes beyond the boundaries of Judaism. It goes beyond the boundaries of Israel. He said even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Got news for you. That includes you and I today. Let me tell you, this is our message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is our message. This is what we preach. Is the biblically prescribed response of believing souls to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cracks me up. The thing I love about cults is they always love to say, well, the church got everything screwed up. The church messed everything up. The Mormons will tell you. The Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you. Oh, uh, Christianity got all twisted and perverted and everything got messed up. And we are restoring the original message. We're restoring what they originally preached and what they originally taught. Really? Because in this passage alone, we have a clear and concise uh, expounding of man's prescribed response to the gospel. Are you preaching that prescribed response? Is that your message? No, it is not. The Word of God said many are called, but few are chosen. Let me tell you, most churches today are not preaching Acts 2.38. Most churches today will point you to Romans. They'll point you to John. They'll point you all over the Word of God and try to tell you that these various passages tell you what you must do to be saved. And yet, in Acts chapter 2, on the birthday of the church, the question is specifically asked, what shall we do? And it is specifically answered. But that is not their message. That's okay. This is our message. Let me tell you something. The Samaritans received the same identical message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Listen. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, meaning they had believed the gospel, they sent unto them Peter and John, 
who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So believing the gospel does not result in your receiving the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, Acts 8. For as yet he, the Holy Ghost, was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that what Peter said to do in Acts chapter 2? Yes, it is. So they had believed the gospel and they had been baptized in the name of the Lord. But if you remember a few moments ago, as I was reading from Acts chapter 2, Peter's statement on the day of Pentecost included two ands. Meaning there were three elements, there were three levels, there were three tiers. There were three acts which were required in response to our believing the gospel. He said repent, that was act number one said, and be, baptized, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now the Samaritans had heard the gospel, they had repented, they had turned from unbelief to faith in Christ, they had been baptized in Jesus' name as evidence of their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they had not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So knowing this, the apostles sent Peter and John to them for the express purpose that they might receive the gift, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Got news for you, honey. The Samaritans received the message of Acts 2.38. The house of Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman soldier, a centurion, calls for Peter after the Lord speaks to him through an angel and tells him to do so. Peter comes to speak to Cornelius' house as he had been instructed by the Lord to do. Now here's Peter in the house of a Gentile. The Roman Catholic Church tries to tell us that Baptism in Jesus' name was only practiced in the early church uh, because it was God trying to get the Jews to acknowledge Jesus. Oh, but wait a minute. When the message of the gospel went to the Gentiles, to the house of Cornelius, let's hear what message they received. Acts 19, 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, or I'm sorry, uh, no, I'm reading the wrong passage. Um, <laughs> it's Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, he's preaching to the house of Cornelius. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. How did they know that the house of Cornelius had received the Holy Ghost? They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them, and he commanded them to be baptized in 
the name of the Lord. The Gentiles at Cornelius' house received the message of Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But you know what? God doesn't require that it happen in this order. You can believe the gospel and repent and then receive the Holy Ghost. You can receive your, or be baptized and then receive the Holy Ghost, or you can receive the Holy Ghost upon believing and then be baptized afterwards. There is no specific, God doesn't say you have to do it in this order. He just says there's three things you need to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It says these three things. Mix and match, honey, but you, you got you to hit on all three of them, okay? Every single body of people that the gospel of Jesus Christ is recorded as having been preached to are recorded as having been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ or in this instance they were commanded to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. At the Gentile converts at Ephesus Listen to the message that the Gentiles at Ephesus also received. In Acts 19, 1 through 7, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. What does that mean? That means they've heard the gospel and they've believed. So they've already repented. They've already turned from unbelief to faith, okay? He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? You don't receive it when you believe, my Baptist friend. That is a misnomer. That is not truth. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Oh my goodness. Boy, y'all, y'all are really working on an old message, aren't you? You say, we're not following the message Peter preached at Pentecost. We're, we're following the message John preached. He preached, repent and believe on Jesus. Hello now. And be baptized according to Jewish tradition of baptism of repentance. Well, that's good enough. You're okay then. No. Let's see if that's what Paul said. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus when they heard this they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus hmm verse 6 Acts 19 and when Paul had laid his hands upon them the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. <laughs> oh, guess what? The people at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost received Acts 2, 38 and 39. The people at the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 received Acts 2, 38 and 39. The Gentile converts at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7, received the message of Acts 2, 38 and 39. What is our message? This is our message. 
We're not a church playing games with God. We're not a church up here. I'm not, I'm, we're not one of them churches that's going to stare you in the eye and not be able to answer the question, once you believe this great gospel, what must I do? We're not going to stand here and give you a false answer. We're not going to stand here and give you a man-made answer. We're not going to stand here and give you some dogma or some doctrine that was concocted by some kind of a religious council somewhere. No, sir. We're going to give you the same message that was preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. We're going to give you the same message that was preached by Peter at the house of Cornelius. We're going to give you the same message that was preached by Paul to the Gentile converts at Ephesus. This is our message. Listen. Acts 4, 10 through 12. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you all. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be Saved. The first and second century of the Christian church only knew one form of water baptism, and that was in the name of Jesus Christ. That formula was not changed to the Trinitarian formula in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost until the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. Three centuries after this gospel was first unleashed in our world and the early seeds, the early beginnings of the Roman Catholic Church changed the mode of baptism so that no longer did they use the name of Jesus Christ but all of a sudden they used the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Honey, the only problem with that is there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The most important element to baptism is not the water, it's the name. When Peter preached at Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Honey, it is the name that does the remitting, not the water. Oh, hallelujah. In Colossians 3.17, the Apostle Paul declares to the church, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything we do. It's so funny. You can go into a Methodist church. You can go into a Baptist church. You can go into a Presbyterian church. You can go into a Baptist church. Any one of them. And everything they do, they do in Jesus' name. Until they bring people to the water to baptize them. All of a sudden, the name of Jesus is discarded. All of a sudden, the name of Jesus isn't as important. When they pray, they always pray in Jesus' name. Oh, when they say a blessing over their food, they always say it in Jesus' name. But when they bring people to the waters of baptism, all of a sudden, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and the name of Jesus is discarded. 
Satan is a very slick enemy. He knew how to remove the most powerful element in the plan of salvation. Honey, let me tell you something. Anybody can preach the gospel. Many do. But not everybody preaches the plan of salvation. But this is our message. We're not just preaching the gospel. We're also preaching the same plan of salvation that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. You know why? Let me tell you why. Remember what we read in Acts chapter 2 a few moments ago about the reaction and the response of the believers on the day of Pentecost? The Word of God said, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Why is this ministry referred to as an, an apostolic ministry? Why do we believe the apostolic message? Because we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine doctrine. Hallelujah. Oh, the same message Peter preached on the day of Pentecost is the same message we ought to be preaching today. Hallelujah. The same gospel that he preached on the day of Pentecost is the same gospel we ought to be preaching today. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you, you better find you a church that not only knows how to preach the gospel, but also knows how to preach the plan of salvation. That is accurate. And that is true. The problem is Satan knows he can convince people they're okay. As long as you're in a church that preaches the gospel, you're okay. <laughs> no, no, no. No, not if when you ask the question, what must I do? They come back with, oh, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If they come back with, come down and shake hands with the preacher and confess Jesus, thou shalt be saved. If they say, oh, pray the sinner's prayer, thou shalt be saved. Show me one instance, one instance, one instance, one instance in the word of God, just one. Show me one, one, one where a single soul was ever, ever, ever instructed to do any of those things in order to be saved. When Philip was led by the Holy Ghost out into the wilderness and he found the eunuch and his chariot and he attached himself to the eunuch on the chariot, he began to talk to him about what he was reading in the book of Isaiah. And he told him about Jesus. And you know what? Philip must have been preaching the same answer to the question, what must I do, that Peter preached. He must have been. You know how I know? Because all of a sudden they come up on a little body of water and the eunuch says, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, wait a minute. If all I have to do is confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God hath raised him from the dead, I'm saved. If all I have to do is pray the sinner's prayer and I'm saved, why would Philip worry about talking to him about baptism? Hello now. Here the eunuch is. He just believed this thing. He just embraced this thing. He just accepted this thing. And immediately he's saying, hey, here's water. What would stop me from being baptized? Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, folks, I want to tell you something. The evidence is clear. The message is clear. The message of the gospel is universal. You hear it preached in many churches. But the message of salvation is not preached in every church. It is not preached everywhere. And I encourage you today to embrace and obey the message of the gospel. The Lord prophesied, I'm closing, the Lord Jesus Christ prophesied concerning the message of the gospel and the plan of salvation 
He prophesied that they would be carried by the apostles to all the ends of the earth. In Acts 1 and 8, Jesus declared, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. On the day of Pentecost, not only were there locals in Jerusalem, but there were people from all over Judea, all over the Jewish world, in the city of Jerusalem. What message were they told? Acts 2, 38 and 39. The Lord said, You be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Oh, Samaria, what was the message the Samaritans received from Peter and John? Acts 2, 38 and 39, we read it. And unto the uttermost parts of the world, the uttermost parts of the earth, what was the message preached to the Gentile converts at Ephesus? Acts 2, 38 and 39, we read it. Honey, the message is simple. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. LGBT person, let me tell you what is exciting about this as I bring this message to a close. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Hallelujah. And when God gives you the Holy Ghost, that's God's seal of approval. You don't need man's. You don't need to worry about whether the church down the road approves of you. You don't need to worry about whether the church down the road accepts you. When God fills you with His Holy Ghost, He has accepted you. He has received you. He has sealed you unto the day of redemption. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, I want to tell you, this is our message. Gospel of Jesus Christ and man's answer to that gospel is Acts 2 38 and 39. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off, even as many. As the Lord our God shall call. Children, that includes today you and me. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. This is our message. Amen. Will you stand with me?